Yeah, so in this problem, we've got a mass uh, of 5 kilograms of liquid and vapor. They're in equilibrium. They're in a piston cylinder device, and the piston has a weight, and the uh, when the piston moves, the pressure, it induces a pressure of 300 kilopascal, and that's just because of the weight of the piston pulling down or pushing down on the air. And so heat is added to the system, and we've got 2 kilograms of liquid water, and we've got therefore we've got three kilograms of va water vapor. So heat's added. Once the pressure reaches 300 kilopascal, the piston moves upward at that point, and heat transfer continues until the volume, until it moves up such that the uh, second volume is 20 percent greater than the original volume. And the first thing we want to do is draw this state transition on a PV diagram. And take a moment, you may want to pause this, but try to draw your own isotherms on this PV diagram. And when I do it, I often uh, screw it up, but I'll draw a temperature like this and a horizontal flat line and something that goes like this. And I've drawn it wrong. I can tell at a glance when I've drawn it wrong because when I compress a liquid, if I squeeze on it and I de decrease its volume, I would expect the pressure to shoot up rapidly. So this pressure is going down and I drew it wrong. So here are correctly drawn isotherms. I've drawn it for three, three different temperatures. And uh, in all cases, you squeeze on it, the liquid, and the pressure shoots up. Here we are in the two-phase envelope. And then when we're uh, uh, out in the steam region or the, the superheated vapor, increasing the volume uh, would reduce the pressure in that vapor. So we want to draw the state transition on this PV diagram. And there's two things that occur. The first is heating under constant volume before the piston is able to rise. And then the, the second one is heating at constant pressure. So at constant volume, the state transition can only move vertically. But at constant pressure, it can only move horizontally. So in the initial state, we've got some vertical transition. But what we don't know is, is it heated enough at this fixed volume? Is it heated to beyond the two-phase uh, region? So did we boil all the water into steam or not? And it turns out that we will. And I'll show you in a second how, uh, how, that's, how we can figure that out. But, and then at that point, once the pressure is great enough, the lid lifts up and we continue at constant pressure to a greater specific volume. So here's the state transition on a PV diagram. To solve these problems, um, so we've drawn the state transition, we want to determine the initial and the final temperature. And to solve these problems, I look for in both states, state 1 and state 2, I compile a, a list of all the intensive variables that I know. So for example, at state 1, I know that the pressure is 125 kilopascal. And because it's a two-phase mixture in equilibrium, I can look up in the water table the initial temperature. So here's the pressure table for saturated water. I'll come down to pressure and kilo, kilopascal, and I'll come down to 125 kilopascal. And what I find at this value, at this pressure, I find a saturation temperature of 105.97 degrees C. And for state 2, all I know is that P2 is equal to 300 kilopascal. And I can't tell you anything about the temperature because I don't know what isotherm uh, I'm encountering here. So if I do another isotherm, it comes out, um, or we would expect that there is some other isotherm that this would intersect, but we don't know how far to the right this arrow is going or, or what isotherm it lands on. But for state one, in contrast, we did know, we do know that the pressure is 125 kilopascal at P1, and because the isotherms are parallel, there once you specify the pressure, you've you've specified the temperature, and we found that T1 was equal to 105 point nine seven degrees C. And maybe I should point out that in, within the two-phase envelope you can specify either the pressure or the temperature but you're not allowed to specify both. So for example in this, this case we have 125 kilopascal and a temperature of 106. If you're in a two-phase region you could never you could never uh, um, specify with say hey I want a pressure of 125 kilopascal at a temperature of 150 degrees C. So you can't arbitrarily specify specify them within the two-phase region. So state two, the only intensive variable that we know is that P2 is equal to 300 kilopascal. But one thing I do know is that the total mass in state one is equal to five kilograms. And that means the total mass in state two, because it's a closed system, is also equal to five kilograms. And another thing that we know is that the volume 
at state 2 is equal to 1.2 times the volume at state 1. So if I knew the volume at state 1, I would know the volume at state 2. And then I could find the specific volume at state 2 because it's simply the actual volume at 2 divided by the total mass in the system, which we know. And if I can get V2, that gives me another intensive variable to work with. So in state 1, because I do know the pressure associated with it, I can find the specific volume of the vapor in state 1, and I can find the specific volume of the liquid in state 1. And if I wanted to find the total volume, I simply take the mass of vapor, multiply that by its specific volume, and add that to the mass of fluid, and multiply that by its specific volume. So in terms of an equation, the specific, or the actual volume, at state 1 looks like this. And I can look up the specific volume of the liquid and the vapor. I can look those up in the saturated water table. And at a pressure of 125 kilopascal, I have a saturated liquid, specific volume for the saturated liquid of 0 0.001 uh, cubic meters per kilogram, and a saturated volume for the vapor of 1.3750 cubic meters per kilogram. So I'll use both of these in that equation. And what I come up with when I plug in numbers is 4.127 cubic meters. And that's the volume at the initial state. So that's the volume, the total volume of the liquid and the vapor beneath this piston before it starts rising. And V2 is 20% bigger, so what I get for V2 is 4.953 cubic meters. So now I can find the specific volume at uh, at the second state, and I get a value of 0 0.9905 cubic meters per kilogram. Out of curiosity at this point, let's try to determine the mass of liquid water that's remaining within here once the piston first starts moving. So the way I've drawn this PV diagram, we would expect, if I drew it right, you know, it came, it, uh, the temperature rose, and it rose until it was outside the two-phase region. So this diagram would suggest that all of the water had boiled off before the piston started moving upward. So we'll try to confirm that. And one way we can do so is we know the pressure. Let's figure out what the specific volume of the vapor would be in this case. And if the specific volume of the vapor, of a saturated vapor at this pressure, if that specific volume is less than the actual volume, or in other words, if the actual volume was bigger than the specific volume associated with a saturated liquid, that means it's, it's now a superheated, a superheated vapor because we've moved to the right of the saturated vapor line. Or I may have misspoke. I might have called this a saturated liquid line. It's a saturated vapor line. So this, the specific volume of the saturated vapor is less than the actual specific volume right before the piston moves. That would means that the gas, or the state, is a superheated vapor. So let's calculate the specific volume uh, right uh, when. Uh, so when the liquid, uh, when the piston first starts moving, we know the volume, we know the mass. We can calculate a specific volume a specific volume of 0.825 cubic meters per kilogram. And now the question is, is this specific volume, is it larger than the saturated, the volume, or specific volume of saturated vapor and at this pressure? So at this pressure, 125 kilopascal, we've got a saturated, so when the fir piston first starts moving, we have a specific volume, 0.825 cubic meters per kilogram, and a pressure of 300 kilopascal. So we want to figure out, is this specific volume, is it greater than the specific volume of saturated vapor? So we come back to the saturated water, the pressure table, and we'll look for a pressure of 300 kilopascal, and this column here is the saturated vapor column. So let's scroll down until we hit 300 kilopascal. And the specific volume of the saturated vapor, in this case, is about 0.6 cubic meters per kilogram. And what we found, before the piston even starts moving, our specific volume is bigger than the specific volume of the saturated vapor. So that means before it even starts moving, we're, uh, in a, the system is uh, in a superheated vapor condition. So to answer the question, how much water is remaining, determine the mass of liquid water when the piston first starts moving. In that case, the mass of the fluid, there is no liquid water remaining once the piston first starts moving. So what we've got to left to find is the final temperature and the amount of work done. So let's think about the final temperature. We know we're in the superheated vapor region, and we know there's a pressure, and 
what else do we know at state 2? We've got P2 is 300 kilopascal, and the specific volume at state 2 is 0 0.9905. So we know two intensive variables, and that is enough in the superheated region to give us any other information that we're interested in, including uh, what we want in this case, which is the temperature. So here's the superheated water table, and we're at a pressure of 300 kilopascal, or 0.3 megapascal. And we're looking, we're thinking about the specific volume. We know the pressure, and we know the specific volume. So we know which subtable to work with, and for each specific volume, we can back out a, uh, a temperature. So here's 300 kilopascal, and this first column is the specific volume, and we want a specific volume of point, about 0.99. So we're going to be somewhere between a specific volume of 0.87 and 1.03. And the, the first one corresponds to a temperature of 300 degrees C, and the second one corresponds to a temperature of 400 degrees C. So the specific volume between these two, we expect to get a temperature between 3 and 400 when, once we interpolate. So here's a general formula for inter linear interpolation. And in this case, our, we can gather our temperature if we know the first temperature on the table, T1, which would be equal, T1 in our case, would equal 300 degrees C. T2 would be 400 degrees C. The specific volume 1 would be 0.87535. And specific volume 2 would be 1.03155. So here's T1, 300 degrees C. T2 minus T1 is 400 minus 300 degrees C. And this is the specific volume that we're interested in. We want to find the temperature at this specific volume. Minus V1, 0.87535. And here we've got V2 minus V1. And these are the two values I read off the table. Plugging in numbers, I come up with a temperature of about 374 degrees C. So this is the, uh, the final temperature in the system. So the, the only thing we have left to calculate is the amount of work that was done in lifting up this piston. And it's important to recognize that no work was done initially because the piston moved, the volume was fixed, there was no flow work, there was no work of moving this piston upward. The only time the work was done was when the volume increased 20% when the piston was lifted. So the boundary work is the integral of PDV, in this case the pressure is constant, so it comes out. We're left with P delta V, and the pressure is 300 kilopascal, or 300,000 pascal, times delta V, which is the volume at state 2, which we calculated, this 4.953, minus V1, which we calculated at 4.127 cubic meters. And what we come up with is a value of 248,000 pascal meters cubed. If I break this down, it, uh, we've got 248,000 uh, pascal is a newton kilogram meter per second squared, a newton per square meter times cubic meters. And that's the same as 248,000 newton meters, or joules, or it's equal to 248 kilojoules.